I stared at boxes of printed newsletters and I questioned my commitment. Was it worth the expense? Should I instead send a digital newsletter? And if so, how often? In this video, I'll share with you why I switched from a printed to a digital newsletter and how often you should send out an email newsletter. Newsletters and blogs are essential forms of communication with your clients. Businesses operate with the assumption that those who buy from you and contract with you for your services are busy people. Many organizations and people and things and priorities are competing for people's attention. In addition to the challenge of digital competition, there are so many distractions. With the constant news of crises, you have to make even more of an effort to remind people of your existence. At the same time, you need to do it in a way that's neither intrusive or annoying. Opt-in newsletters and blogs present an elegant, and if you produce them well, engaging way to capture and retain your readers' interests. Let me share my perspective on the difference between newsletters and blogs. To be relevant, you need to post on your blog between one to seven times a week. Whatever frequency you choose, be as consistent as possible. Personally, I would think twice before committing to a daily blog. A team of writers would make this easy, but most solo entrepreneurs would find it to be a huge commitment. Blog posts traditionally run between 500 to 800 words in length. Google prefers, however, that you occasionally write even longer blog posts. Overall, they'll provide bite-sized content about specific topics that will be of interest to your readers. On the other hand, newsletters are typically less frequent than blogs, and they can be lengthier. How you send your newsletter is a crucial factor in how often you send it. Let me explain. When I ran my legal nurse consulting business, I created quarterly newsletters at first. I wrote the content, I got them laid out, I got them printed, I got them mailed, and yes, they were printed. Here were the challenges. First, I had to decide how much information to include and on what topics. I served attorneys who handled cases with medical issues, but not all of my clients handled the same kinds of cases. The medical malpractice attorneys, for example, had specific interests that were different than the attorneys who handled car crashes and slips and falls. I picked topics that were more general, like how to analyze medical records. My first newsletters filled four pages of an 11 by 17 inch paper. It was folded and it was designed to be a self mailer. How much did I have to write to fill four pages? It turned out a lot. The newsletter typically had three or four articles. When I first started sending out my newsletters, I had a small mailing list. My mailing list grew and therefore my printing costs also grew. I priced different printers to see what thousands of copies would cost, and it turns out thousands of dollars. I had to have a person on staff who had the skills to lay out the newsletter. That took time to achieve, and then I had to pay for postage. After sending out quarterly four-page newsletters for several years, I got feedback that I should consider preparing a shorter newsletter. I decided to cut back to a newsletter that was front and back. That meant I had to get it folded in thirds and closed somehow. I bought a folding machine. If you have never seen folding machines, let me tell you, these are heavy, noisy, loud beasts. I put them on the table in my library and it required constant care to avoid jamming. Then we tackled how to keep the folded newsletter closed. We tried staples for closing the newsletter. The post office was not thrilled with that. They're not a good choice for mailing machines. 
labels were a better choice. These little circles that you use to close the newsletter, somebody had to apply them by hand. We bought these little circles that we could fold in half. Next, I decided to bypass the folding and closing newsletters. What if I kept them flat? What if I added a cover letter? Great idea, we thought. We can peel off clear or white labels printed with the person's name and address and put them in large white flat envelopes. That way we could send a cover letter and a newsletter. There is an art in getting the names and addresses to appear on the right part of the label. And there's an art in peeling labels off the laser printer roll so that you don't damage the roller, you don't burn yourself, or you don't electrocute yourself. I reasoned that if I used a large flat envelope that had a window in it, then we could skip the labels. I could therefore put in the letter and the newsletter with the letter lined up in the right place so that it would be visible through the window. I ordered envelopes with our logos and with the little clear window. And we experimented with how to lay out the letter so that it would have the address in the correct position. I took the project to a center in our town that employed handicapped people and asked them to stuff these letters and put them into these envelopes. When the post office began returning envelopes to us because they were undeliverable, I saw that some of the workers had put in the letter so that it was backwards and all you could see through the window was a blank back of the letter. I called the supervisor and I explained the issue and the supervisor said, well, on the next job that we gave them, I should staple the letter and the newsletter together and indicate which was the front. At that point, my desire to help the local handicapped people in the town disappeared, and I decided that I would have that done in-house. I had a part-time person who enjoyed very much stuffing envelopes. She was able to do this at home, and it fattened her paycheck. This experiment, though, with printed newsletters led me to think about a digital newsletter. No designing, no printing, no stuffing, no postage. I could send it out as often as I wished. I went from spending several thousands of dollars on printed newsletters to spending only the time of my support staff to put that easing together and hit the send button. Sending digital newsletters also meant that I could segment my list so I could send specific information to medical malpractice attorneys and other specific information to personal injury attorneys, for example. The question then for you is how often should you go through the effort of creating a digital newsletter? Your newsletter can be published once a month. It could be pub published once a week, every other week. There are people who send out daily newsletters but you do run the risk of annoying your subscribers. Again, be consistent and see what frequency works for you. You can often determine this by looking at the open rates and look at the, looking at the unsubscribe rates immediately after you send out a newsletter. A high unsubscribe rate means, oh no, not again. A newsletter also provides information in a more leisurely way. You can offer a more extensive look at your industry or consumer issues. You can interview an influencer or publish guest posts. You can take an in-depth look at new services that you're offering. You can profile an employee who has made significant contributions to your business. With our shortened attention spans, I recommend shorter newsletters. One article and a link to a video or a podcast should be enough. If you request any of our free reports on patire.com, you'll receive our once a week easings. And you'll quickly notice how I keep the content relevant and brief. 
both your newsletter and your blog should always provide links to your website. How can you drive readers to both forms of publications? Newsletters and blog posts can be interactive. Strive for engagement with blog posts or a longer article when you send out an email newsletter. A newsletter can highlight recent blog posts. For example, you can add links to your most viewed blog posts and encourage the reader to click a link or a button to read the full post. Another way to generate client interest is to invite comments. Make this invitation in a way that shows that you genuinely care about readers' opinions. Reinforce this by answering those who respond and with permission, quote those responses. With care and commitment, you can turn your newsletter and blog into a voice that authentically represents your appreciation of the people who make your business thrive. And I know that physical snail mail now is a novelty and some marketers recommend sending out printed newsletters. I'm not returning to that practice anytime soon. See my e-zine system in action by heading to patire.com and request our free reports and you'll receive our weekly e -zine. You can model your digital newsletter after mine. And before you go, Click on the subscribe button to be notified of new videos on writing tips.